Hello and welcome to the first lecture of Biology 211 at Mount Hood Community College. Um, this is me, Katherine Creech, and my fabulous cat, Callie. Um, today for our first lecture, I just wanted to go over a little bit of what we're going to be doing in class and why it is so awesome. So thank you for watching. I'm really excited about this. I want to start with why cell biology is so cool and to, to try and convince you how cool it is. I've got two pictures in front of you. On the left, we have this bright pink thing with these long legs coming off it. My goal in this is to pretend like you're sitting next to me, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit. So what do you think that is? And hopefully you said, I think it's a neuron. And if you said you think it's a neuron, you're totally correct, that is a neuron. What's really cool about neurons is you have about trillions of them, like a lot, a lot of neurons. And they do this really incredible thing for you, allowing you to think and feel and have emotion to remember things, but also to control your body, to give you sensation. Um, the longest neuron in your body runs from your hip crease all the way down to your big toe. Like, that's, that's several feet long, it's pretty impressive. And if we were to zoom in on that bright yellow spot in the center, we would see the body of the neuron, which is the image on the right. In the image on the right, we've stained different parts of the cell to light up. The DNA is stained in blue, so that's gonna be your nucleus of your neuron. The skeleton, the cytoskeleton of the cell is stained in green that's pushing sideways, giving it that wispy appearance. And the cell membrane is stained in red. That's the barrier around the cell that keeps the outside out and the inside in. So really incredible that you have just trillions of these and they're allowing you to process the words that I'm saying to you right now. Pretty impressive. So I think humans are super cool, but uh, there's also a bunch of other cool organisms that exist like mammals. And one of the things that all mammals have is warm blood. So these are the red blood cells in blood. And you make about 3 million red blood cells every second. That's how important these things are to your body. You just have to be constantly producing them. The shape is called a biconcave disc. That's that little push in donut shape that it has by being too concave, being the inward pushing in on your donut. And the shape of the red blood cell is indented in the center because this cell does not have a nucleus. So having a nucleus is something that we say human cells always have, but it's not completely true because red blood cells are lacking a nucleus. That explains why you have to make so many of them. If you don't have a nucleus, you don't have the information you need to repair your cell. So red blood cells have a really short lifespan. They get destroyed about a month after they're created. So you have to continually make more blood so that you can transport oxygen to your tissues and survive. That's the goal of your blood is bringing your cells oxygen. We're gonna talk about why oxygen is so important for cells a little bit later on. If I haven't told you yet, my undergrad is in botany, so I'm a big plant nerd. Here are our beautiful plant cells. It almost looks like stained glass to me. The um, hexagon shape is the cell wall of the plant. Humans don't have cell walls, so those neurons and those red blood cells didn't have a cell wall on them. And all the green blobs inside this beautiful plant cell are the chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are what take sunlight energy and help transfer it into sugar energy. That process is called photosynthesis and it's one of the last things that we'll talk about this term. So beautiful plant cells. And then my favorite cell of all time, this is a mushroom. It's actually a whole lot of mushroom cells. The line of little club shapes sticking upward, that's the top of the mushroom cap and it's been cut, so we're looking into the inside of the cap. 
This is a picture I took when I was doing my graduate work because I studied mycology in grad school, which was the study of mushrooms. And I love this picture because it kind of looks like intestines, but it's also kind of creepy. It's kind of gothic, right? Because it's all sepia black and white. Um, but it's also really impressive to me because it highlights how much we don't really know about cellular biology yet. Like there's a lot of questions I have about this creature looking at the cells. So a lot of fun mysteries still to discover. You, dear student, are uh, listening to this and hopefully playing along. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to take a moment and think about what makes something living. That's our whole point of biology is the study of life. So I want you to brainstorm five characteristics that you could use to identify living things. And I have this picture in front of you of a cat in a pot. And I want you to think about five things that tell you that that cat is alive, but that the pot doesn't have. Like how can you distinguish something living from something non-living? I'll give you about 30 seconds to think about it. Cool, so hopefully you came up with some ideas. Um, when I ask this question in class, which I do this in class, I often get answers like, well, the cat's warm and the cat's fuzzy and the cat can move and the cat will you know, jump out of the pot if you turn the pot on or if you turn the stove on or the cat can meow, the cat eats food, the cat bleeds. And those are all fabulous examples for the cat. But what if we change it? And we look at this. Did you come up with any characteristics of life that you could apply to the sunflower and to the cat? So with the sunflower, now we can't talk about it being warm or having blood or moving so much anymore. We have to start thinking deeper about what kind of things make a living thing living. And we can, we know a little bit about plants as, you know, the average person, but what if we change it from this fabulous sunflower to this amoeba? This amoeba is very, very small. It's microscopic. It lives in water, so it's found in like rivers and lakes and marshy places. Did any of the characteristics that you think about living creatures for the cat and the sunflower, can they apply to the amoeba? So that's one of our problems with biology is we have to think about living things beyond ourselves, And we, we tend to be egocentric and we tend to like thinking about humans and mammals and things that are really cute like that cat. But we have to work beyond ourselves and try and come up with characteristics for all living things. And it's actually kind of hard to define whether or not something's living. So biologists have come up with seven criteria. These are the seven characteristics of life. The first one is that all living things are composed of one or more cells. That's called the cell theory. I wanna make a note about the word theory. In average life, we use the word theory to mean like a guess, like, oh, I have a theory about that. But that doesn't work in biology. In biology, theory has a completely different meaning. So in biology, the word theory means that we have tested this idea scientifically and have a lot of data to support it. A theory is a really well-supported hypothesis. So the cell theory means that every living thing that we've looked at is made of cells. So much that we can't really imagine life without cells. 
if we were to find life on Mars, we imagine that it would include cells just because it's so fundamental to our concept of life. Um, some other example of theories is the theory of gravity. Every time we've tested gravity, the evidence supports that gravity exists. So theory in biology means something that has a lot of data backing it up. The second characteristic of life is that all living things maintain homeostasis. So homeostasis is the process of maintaining an internal balance. I'm maintaining my body temperature right now with homeostasis. If I get too hot, I'll start to sweat and that cools me down. If I get too cold, I'll start to shiver and that warms me up. Um, we also do this with other things like our water intake. If I don't have enough water, I'll get thirsty, I'll drink more water. If I have too much water, I'll push it through my kidneys and urinate it out, I'll get rid of the water. We do this for salts and ions. We do this for a lot of different things inside of our body. We're trying to maintain a small range where we can survive. It's like the balance of living um, parameters. So if you get too cold, you get hypothermia and you die. You get too hot, you get heat stroke and you die. Maintaining yourself in the right balance, that's homeostasis. So other organisms have to do this too. If you don't water your houseplants enough, they dehydrate and die. And that's really a loss of homeostasis. The third thing that happens for all living things is obtaining and using energy. So animals, we eat things. That first cat I showed you, it has to eat its food. Fungus have to eat their food. Some organisms get to make their own food by photosynthesis, like that sunflower I showed you. So that's pretty cool. And then use that energy once they have it. So I will eat, you know, a piece of toast and I'll use the energy to power my body. The fourth characteristic of life is that all living things can reproduce, not individuals, like some individuals are not able to reproduce, but as a whole, the species can reproduce. Because if the species can't reproduce, then it dies off pretty quickly. So living things can reproduce. Maybe they don't choose to or don't have an opportunity to, but theoretically that they can. All living things also grow and develop. This is why you don't look like a toddler anymore. You've grown from a toddler to an adolescent to an adult. You developed in maturity, you developed mentally, you developed sexually. So you change over the course of your life. That is growth and development. You see the same thing with um, dogs, but you also see it with like that sunflower started off as a little tiny sunflower seed. And then it was a little plant and then it got a blood and then the blood bloomed and it became a sunflower. So growth and development. The sixth characteristic of life is that all living things can respond to stimuli. A stimuli is anything outside of your body that you react to. So for humans, it's mostly our senses. We can see light and respond to it. We can hear sounds and respond to it. We can feel touch and respond to it. We can taste when something doesn't taste right and spit it out. That's all responding to stimuli. Plants are very similar. If you turn a plant upside down, it'll right itself. That's called gravitropism. It can tell which way is up and down, just like you can. Fungi will grow toward food, so they can sense food in their area that's responding to stimuli. And the last thing is that all living things evolve. And this is an interesting one. Uh, we're gonna talk about evolution a lot in 213, so very excited about that. And evolution simply defined is just change over time. A organism itself can't change, like I can change as a person because I'm a human and that's cool, but we're talking about the species changing over time. So you don't look exactly like your parents who don't look exactly like their parents who didn't look like your great grandparents. That is the human species changing over time. Every generation is a little bit different, thus it is evolving. So we have these awesome seven characteristics. We could apply them all to our cat that we saw in the pot at the beginning. That cat's made of cells, it uses energy, it maintains homeostasis, it can have kittens, those kittens would grow up. If I turned on the pot, it would hop out the pot 
and over time cats have evolved from feral creatures to these domesticated little animals. It works for our sunflower, it works for our amoeba, but there are some things on earth that we don't know whether or not they're living. Like, we can't really figure out whether or not they fit into these seven characteristics. And here's an example that's really important right now. Do you recognize this? It's the coronavirus. So, a really interesting thing, I'm not gonna call it an organism, <laughs> but a really interesting um, thing that exists on Earth Let's, let's go through and let's try and figure out whether or not this virus is living. Here are our seven characteristics. The first question is, is this virus made of cells? What do you think? So viruses are made of um, protein exoskeleton coats. It's not really an exoskeleton, but it's like a coat. And then inside is some DNA. And that's it. It doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have cytoplasm or cytoskeleton or all the really cool stuff that you're going to learn. It's just protein wrapped around DNA. So that does not fit our definition of a cell. So it is not composed of cells. Since it's not composed of cells, it can't maintain its internal environment. It doesn't really care what the temperature is or it doesn't drink water or anything like that so it doesn't maintain an internal balance so it does not maintain homeostasis the third one reproduce this one's questionable question mark right because we know it makes more of itself but it turns out that the virus doesn't actually make more of itself by itself the way a virus works is a virus infects a host cell. It breaks open its protein coat. It takes its DNA and it puts its DNA into the host cell's DNA. And then when the host cell goes to divide, it reads the virus DNA as if it's its own and the host cell makes more virus. So, it can't reproduce on its own. It has to be inside of a host to make more of itself. It doesn't make more of itself by itself, but there do become more of the virus. So I think that counts. I'm gonna give it a check mark. You started with one, you ended up with several more. That's reproduction. Some scientists would argue that that's not true reproduction, but I'm gonna roll with it. <clears throat> the fourth one is that living things can grow and develop. Viruses do not grow. They never get bigger, they never get smaller, and they don't change, they just exist. So they do not grow, they do not develop. Question five, obtain and use energy. There's no reason to really have energy if you're not gonna grow and you're not gonna maintain homeostasis and you don't need to make more cells. But we don't really know if this counts because when this host cell is reproducing and making more virus, it uses energy for itself. So the virus benefits from the host cell's energy, but does that count as using energy on its own? I really don't know. I'm gonna leave it as a question mark. <laughs> question number six, all living things can respond to stimuli. If we shine a light on the coronavirus, it doesn't respond. It doesn't respond to temperature. It doesn't respond to food. It doesn't respond to ions. But it does know when it's reached a suitable host because it will infect that host cell. So this one's kind of a question mark as well. We're not, we're not really sure. And maybe the stimulus that we're seeing is something we don't understand yet. There needs to be more research in this. And then the last one is evolve. This one is a big check mark. That's the one we're sure of. Um, viruses evolve really quickly. And one of the reasons they evolve really quickly is they mutate constantly. They're not good at replicating their DNA. 
And so every time a host cell reproduces more virus, each of the offspring is a little bit different. And since they're a little bit different each time, that's our definition of evolution, change over time. This actually explains why the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is so hard to treat. If I were to be infected with HIV today, it would get into my cells. My cells would duplicate more HIV virus. And then in a month or so, the type of HIV I might have could be completely different than the HIV that originally infected me. Because it mutates so quickly, it's really rapidly evolving. And so you have to try and target your treatment to the type of virus that somebody has today, which might not be the same type they have in a couple months. It's very complicated. So is coronavirus alive? Uh, I don't know, you know, who knows? We're, we're kind of divided on this in the sciences. Some people think that those two yes check marks are enough to count something as living. Some people think that all those X's were enough to discount it completely. So you could kind of make up your own mind on this. I tend to lean against it. I don't think that they're living, mainly because I like the idea that you have to be made of cells to be living. But you get to come up with your own opinion um, or not, you know, <laughs> not gonna force you to have an opinion on this. But what I do wanted to end with is if you're curious about the coronavirus or viruses in general, where to get good information because there's a lot of bad information going on. Good information is from our CDC. It's the Center for Disease Control. I have the website up here and that is where you can find the most recent facts, um, what the symptoms are like. You could even find uh, risk factors involved with something that you want to do, like how risky is going to the beach? How risky is riding in a car with someone else? So go check it out. Get some new current information if you want. I think it's worthwhile to, to know it. And the CDC has information on all sorts of other viruses as well. That is the end of our first lecture. Thank you so much for, for listening and watching. I hope you have a great day.